Hello to all of you. Well, it's uh, wonderful to have so many of you online again tonight. We've got a very exciting uh, webinar. It's it's a webinar that we've actually done. Oh, what's going on there? <laughs> the, the presentation's uh, too excited to get going. It's a webinar we've actually done for, for many years uh, with, with James and Andrew, both friends of mine. And we wanted to look back at, at 2017. We wanted to see, you know, it was a really interesting year. We, we learned a lot of lessons. And, um, and then most importantly, we really wanted to, to pick their brains in terms of where are we going in 2018 so that we can make educated and informed decisions. So before I go into this little movie, I just wanted to welcome James coming live from America and Andrew, I presume, coming live from Cape Town with no water. Johannesburg. Are you in Johannesburg? <laughs> Did you fly up there to get some water? Yeah, at a shower. <laughs> awesome. And James, yeah. where, whereabouts are you? I know you're on the East Coast of America. Whereabouts exactly? Uh, at the moment, I'm in a, uh, just outside Charlotte in North Carolina, place uh, Mintel. Fantastic. Well, it's wonderful to have both of you online. And as I said, it's always been a privilege every year to do this. And it's always astounded me how accurate you guys have been, uh, whether you know the rand's going up, it's going down, or, or other currencies and, and from the economic perspective. Before we get into the details, I wanted to share with everyone a short little two-minute video on a reminder of what we went through in 2017. After Trump's election, America is bracing itself for conflict. I knew quite a few families in here. I know some that go out and I know some that didn't. The distance between the war and the civilian line is almost like a A brand new investigation into the tax lives of the rich and famous. Africans have benefited from their experience of white supremacy. You're talking nonsense. How can you deny France is in the middle of its most divisive election in a generation. They gave the best possible immediate response to those who seek to divide us. And it will be that spirit of Manchester that will prevail and hold us together. I mean, I said, I mean yes, we marry you. There's an early election on. Another big political moment for the UK. Another series running around the West. What the country needs more than ever is certainty. Brexit. This is it. Our foundation is social justice. Every woman that I know is coming to this march. My hope is that the resilience of the Dominican people is matched by a global effort to protect those bearing the brunt of climate change. It's yours. You own it. For years, we've had to hide our sexuality, and now we feel that we Australia is backing us. We are here! We will not go away! It's a new approach, and we're scaring people. We are here to stay. We are on a roller coaster ride. We are having sex as well. So it's been a pretty interesting year, as I'm sure everyone uh, can appreciate. And, you know, just some of the things that come to mind, you know, obviously a lot of uh, talk around Trump in 2017, Brexit and the impact, you know, with, uh, with Brexit now leaving, you know, within two years, uh, or England leaving Zuma and you know firing the finance minister and everything that that brought on in 2017. North Korea firing missiles and and keeping us all pretty excited. The terrorist attacks, you know, it was amazing when I was watching some of those videos. Just as a prelude, how many there actually were. You know, Mugabe being replaced. I think you know this this one was pretty interesting as a half ex Zimbabwean. It was pretty cool that he finally left after 37 years. Cyril Ramaphosa, I think, was a was a very big thing for South Africans in general and uh, where the ANC is going. You know, we've got environmental disasters, including, like I've already mentioned, Cape Town, you know, literally running out of water with, uh, you know, with, with what's happening there. And, you know, the Me Too campaign we saw towards the end of that video and, and women really standing up um, for their rights and, and, and what's been happening. And then, you know, the whole crypto mania, which we're going to talk a little bit about and, uh, and what went crazy in the sort of crypto world, you know, the Bitcoin world in, uh, in 2017. 
But you know, tonight I'm really, really excited to to you know welcome two people. And um, sorry, I need to just uh, what am I going to do to stop this Telegram group making noises? Give me two seconds, otherwise it's going to drive us all crazy. Uh, this is called Telegram, so if you know anything about uh, cryptocurrency, you'd be on Telegram. But anyway, <laughs> um, let me go back to so just confirm quickly, James and Andrew, are you guys seeing? Uh, you should be back to Trump and Brexit. Yeah, we yeah. can see right down to Cryptomania. Okay, great. So I just wanted to get rid of that Telegram because I was going to click all night. So just to you know, to just to welcome you know, so that people understand. And I know that James and Andrew are going to give you more details. But in simple terms, I met James. I don't know exactly, but it feels at least sort of ten years ago. And James really specializes in helping people forecast where. Uh, currencies are going so he focused to start off with on the rand he's now living in america and he's focusing on all all the major currencies and what i'm quite excited about is that he's also going to focus on um well my understanding is he's going to focus on cryptocurrencies because at the end of the day it's all really based on the same graphs the same formulas because it's based on human emotion and sentiment which i'll let james go into a lot more detail you know when when he actually shows you the other person is andrew rizek and Andrew runs and is part of an organization called Sable. Now, Sable is a listed company out of the UK. They've got a major operational office out of Cape Town. And they fundamentally do a lot of things. And again, Andrew will go into all the detail. But he's been the driving force behind their forex. So while James is looking at the graphs and predicting where things are going, and I'm going to go into just now in terms of the accuracy of the predictions that I've witnessed over the last 10 years, Andrew's the one that's actually dealing with it. He's actually dealing with the money movements. He's dealing with the sentiment. He's dealing with, you know, dealing with, you know, entrepreneurs and businessmen and businesses and what their feelings are. So, you know, it's without further ado that I really wanted to get into tonight's webinar and take it from very different context. And and what I think is also lovely is that, you know, James now living in in America can give us some good insights into what's happening in America. And equally from your side, Andrew, I know you travel a huge amount and with your you know major major head office out of the UK are very sort of in tune with what's happening in England and 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 I know you do a lot of work out of Portugal and, and, and Europe as well. So guys it's it's awesome to have you um, online tonight. I really wanted to get into literally the first the first question and James let's start with yourself. What were your three biggest lessons from 2017? You know it was an interesting year and for you it was also one where you moved to America. So it was a very you know very exciting and challenging year. But what were the three biggest lessons that you learned? Yeah, I'd, I'd say it, um, yeah, as you say, very, very interesting year and um, roller coaster year in in um, in one way. But um, I think what we saw was um, one of the one of the biggest lessons to me was that the markets themselves definitely don't move um, based on you know how we'd normally think they should move. I mean, but if you'd look at what we had last year, all the events that we had and mostly bad news, to be sitting where we are with the rand, where it is today, it just doesn't make sense. Um, but uh, other other lessons, of course, through the year was, um, you know, that cryptocurrencies, Bitcoin, that sort of thing is definitely here to stay. And governments are fighting it, um, but I see it's it is the future. Um, and then also, um, I think it, a few of those um, the clips that you showed there was showing the the effect that you know social media and the crowd are having on events, whether it's um, you know political or social or, or economic. I'd say that's probably my lessons I've taken from this this past year. Awesome, thank you, James. From your side, Andrew. Yeah, well, I think the one uh, one big lesson that I think we should all uh, be really, really careful to learn is don't always believe everything that you see on social media. I think the uh, the, the terminology fake news has um, really read its head and become a reality in all of our lives. And I think you know, just in my personal experience, in the last two days intelligent friends of mine have been sending whatsapps around um, about some new water bylaw in cape town I and mean, if you actually take the time to read it as a person who understands how a town or a city is run 
you can see it's rubbish, but the fact is that everybody talks about it, they believe it. And I think that um, you, you've just got to learn to look past that noise and really don't just challenge and question everything that you read. Um, the other thing that I've learned is that hard currencies can be extremely volatile. I think as a South African, we tend to really be quite negative about the RAND. And, um, you know, it's always the RAND is this, the RAND is that. So with a lot of negativity around the RAND. However, um, you know, just some of those points you raised, Donald Trump, um, Brexit. Brexit, uh, the British pound took a massive devaluation after Brexit, which actually created a fantastic buying opportunity to invest in the UK at the time. And what's interesting now is the pound is actually stronger than where it was before Brexit. You know, it sort of crept back. And again, you know, I mean, that's volatility, if ever there was. And, um, you know, I think what people must realize is that when a currency dips off like that very quickly, is that there's really a good investment opportunity. And that's something that we also learn with the RAND. And, um, and then the third thing is, you know, at the end of the day, just look at the fundamentals because that's really what the, what the long-term direction of, of any, any of these currencies is, is determined by the underlying fundamentals um, within that economy against whichever currency you're comparing. Awesome. Well, just, uh, just quickly, I, I, I thought I would just write down three from my side as well. You know, for me, it's interesting. And a lot of what we're going to talk about tonight is – you know, often people don't see things coming, uh, literally until it impacts their lives. But then equally, I loved a comment that Willem van der Post said last year, and it's such a good metaphor. He said, imagine like a bunch of wildebeest that are out on the plane in, you know, in a game reserve, you know, in the felt. And suddenly this one wildebeest gets stung by, uh, by a wasp or a flea. And suddenly it, it jumps up and it doesn't know what's happened, but it starts running. And so the wildebeest next to him looks to the wildebeest that's running and goes, well, hang on, there must be a problem. So he starts running. And the wildebeest after that starts running. And I think 2017 for me was a classic year. And it's interesting you use the word fundamentals, um, Andrew, where you know a lot of people don't see the macroeconomic changes that are happening. And yet they get very caught up in, in hype cycles of, of what's happening. The second thing for me was, you've already mentioned it, James, was the power of the crowd. And I loved what happened around Bell Pottinger, which was the biggest PR agency in the UK going bankrupt over the whole, you know, uh, Zuma scandal and, and the Guptas and all that. And equally, you know, KPMG, one of the top four accounting firms in the world, equally having massive pressure. And it's just two examples of how the crowd can, can really, you know, really start to influence things. And the third thing I think is really, for me, was diversification and the power of technology. And again, you know, when you consider what was happening in 2017 with all the inconsistencies around the world and, and all the challenges that people are facing, a lot of people want to diversify. And up until now, it's been impossible to do it. And, and yet with technology, more and more people are being able to participate. Now, a good example is, you know, you can invest in a Bitcoin with 100 Rand and, um, you know, or $10. Uh, in the past, that wasn't possible. You couldn't cut this sort of stuff up. And it's the same with whether it's cryptocurrency or real estate. You know, buying a property in London was only for the very exclusive in the past, whereas now it's, it's now becoming a possibility for people. So they truly can um, diversify. Let's move on to the second one which is, you know, what is the state of the global economy um, and, and specifically sort of emerging markets like South Africa and some of the first world markets? You know, um, from your perspective, let's, let's start with you, Andrew. You know, um, you spend, like I said, you spend a lot of time in England and, and, and Europe. What, what is your state on where we are with the global economy and, and what's happening? Well, I think that, um, I think if you look at the global economy compared to, I mean, I think our last benchmark was, was um, the global financial crisis in 2008. <clears throat> the reality is, um, you know, I think if you look at the, the so-called developed nations, things are actually looking quite good. Um, you know, unemployment is record lows in many countries. Property prices are, are recovering. You know, if they're not at pre, pre sort of global financial crisis levels, they're certainly well towards that. Um, you know, so, so I think that, and, and there's growth. I mean, Europe is, is the sort of the, the, you know, the new, sort of bell of the ball. Britain had a good run before Brexit. Um, America's sort of shown some positive signs, but I think, the, I think the concern for me around the global economy is that what has is, what is really driven a lot of this recovery, and, and I think it's, it's really underwritten by massive amounts of, of, of national debt, and the so-called quantitative easing that was very topical a few years ago. Uh, we haven't been talking about it lately, but I mean, those, that bond buying has been has been happening, although on a lower scale, the last couple of years. 
Um, so I think national debt levels are the things that we need to look out for and how that debt bubble, I mean, the USD, we're talking at over 21 trillion US dollars. Um, you know, that's their national debt up from 11 trillion in 2008, 2009. Um, so that's, that's certainly for me a flag to look out for. When that's going to start having an impact, I don't know. And um, I think that emerging market economies, generally emerging markets have had a reasonably good run recently um, because, you know, we've, we've, we've generally got quite higher interest rates. So you see quite a lot of short term investment coming into the emerging markets. However, the emerging markets took a bit of a knock yesterday because the reality is that interest rates are going to start going up on the US dollar, the euro and the pound. Um, and, you know, once that momentum starts kicking in, We'll probably see a bit of downward pressure on emerging markets and commodity prices had a sort of a muted recovery in 2017 which has been positive i mean that's been ran positive for sure um and in a lot of other emerging markets that, that are commodity driven so um i think there's just for me still uncertainty around the around the sort of buying of 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 debt that that for me is the big concern excellent and from your side james i mean obviously You've been on the ground in America dealing with, uh, you know, all the changes that's been happening under Trump in 2017. What, 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 what's your take on it? Yeah, I, uh, you know, with uh, so on the on the, the Trump factor, that although there's a lot of negatives, um, he's clearly been doing some some right things from you know uh, boosting the economy point of view. But um, I would have to agree with with Andrew with regard to the US as well as you know um, Europe as well that the biggest problem is is debt um, you you're speaking about the national debt Andrew but if you look at total debt of the just the US looking at somewhere around about um, 60 trillion sure now um, that is that is more than than double um, what we were in terms of of GDP as a percentage of GDP, um, where we were before the the Great Depression, and what brought on the Great Depression was um, was a, a debt bubble. Now, what's what's happened since 2008 2009 is they fixed a debt problem by creating more debt. So the problem hasn't gone away. We've we've just created a bigger problem from 2008 and 2009. So that is that is worrying to me because at some point that is going to that bubble is going to burst, um, and then if you look at the South African economy, we we're in a similar situation where you know our debt, uh, government debt has has doubled in the past what is it, about five years or so, um, when we we sitting with you know fifty percent of GDP is 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 in debt, so. And coupled with that, you know, we've had uh, our net investment position with South Africa that um, it's turned um, from being positive, you know, funds coming in to actually net funds going out. So, you know, I'm not, um, there's some big problems out there. And um, you know, I'm not as much uh, on the on the ground side of, things as, as Andrew is, but um, yeah, to me, there are there's some concerns coming the next couple of years. So um, it's interesting you both speak about debt, and I, I found myself a little uh, $100 note here that you should all be able to see and uh, on my webcam. And the, the part I love most is that it says on the back, in God we trust. Um, and uh, and really, that, that is the basis of, of fiat currencies. And, and one of the reasons why there's been such a rise of blockchain and cryptocurrency. So I just wanted to share with you quickly, because the purpose of tonight is not to go into all this detail. But if you do know that um, there's just been in Davos, which is the World Economic Forum, and it's one of the uh, most important events of the year, particularly, and this was a paper that came out from the IMF. And it literally came out on the 22nd of January. So it's absolutely brand new. I can, um, I'll send the link, uh, I'll put it in the chat box for everybody, uh, just so that you know, but if I if I go quickly to, to my to my page here, um, you can see it there. So it's effectively the IMF.org. I just wanted to read to you just a couple of things that I think are, are relevant here. Um, so they say brighter prospects, op optimistic markets, challenges ahead, 
Global economic activity continues to firm up. Global output is estimated to have grown by 3.7% in 2017, which is 0.1% percentage point faster than projected in the fall and half a percent point higher than in 2016. The pickup in growth has been broad-based with notable uprises, uh, upside surprises in Europe and Asia. Global growth forecasts for 2018 and 2019 have been revised upward by 0.2% to 3.9%. The revision reflects the increased global growth momentum and the expected impact of the recently approved U.S. tax policies. So there's a lot of talk, and you've mentioned, uh, you know, the Trump administration. There's a lot of talk of the impact that um, the short-term impact is going to have in America from a tax perspective. And it says they continue to see growth through to 2020, uh, culminating in 1.2% uh, through that year. Then the risks, which is also interesting, the risks to global growth forecast appear to be broadly balanced in the near term, but remain skewed to the downside over the medium term. On the upside, the cyclical rebound could prove stronger in the near term as the pickup in activity and easier financial conditions reinforce each other. On the downside, and this is what's really important, rich asset valuations and very compressed long-term premiums raise the possibility of a financial market correction, which could dampen growth and confidence. A possible trigger is faster than expected increase in advanced economies, core inflation and interest rates as demand accelerates. If global sentiment remains strong and inflation muted, then financial conditions could remain loose in the medium term, loading to a buildup of financial vulnerabilities in advanced and emerging economies alike. And then um, lastly, it says, yeah, the current cyclical upswing provides an ideal opportunity for reforms. And I did want to just say here, since mid-2016, 120 countries have, um, have actually, so three quarters of the world's GDP, have seen a pickup in growth year on year in 2017, the broadest synchronized global growth since 2010. The advanced economies have grown with a specific focus on Germany, Japan, Korea, and the United States. And what's interesting is it says key emerging markets and developing economies, including Brazil, China, and South Africa, also posted third quarter growth stronger than the, the full forecast. So there's a whole uh, eight-page report here that, um, that I'm not going to bore you with all the details, but uh, I will post that in, in the link in terms of what is actually happening. So I want to get on to, to really the genius of, of both James and Andrew. And, you know, for me, I, I want to start with, with James. You know, we've, we've done a lot of work together, and, and I highly recommend that if you think this is the first time you've seen James, go back and watch any of the YouTube recordings of where we've done this in the past. You know, one of the ones that, that I remember so vividly was in, I think, 2013, 2014. I can't remember the exact year, but I remember it was in about uh, May time. And he stood on stage and he said to guys, we were at 888 to the rand that day. And he said, with more than a 90% probability, we're going to go over 10 rand to the dollar. And it's going to happen in three months. And what was amazing to me is it happened in about six weeks. And then everyone turned around and went, oh, how did that happen? And he literally showed people why it was going to happen. And I know, Andrew, you, you've shared a similar story when we were, the three of us were just talking privately around how often James does this and how accurate he actually is. And, and without further ado, I wanted to hand over to you, James, so you could give us some insights into where you think we're going in 2018. I'm going to share my, my screen with you so that uh, you can take over. Uh, there you are. Okay, so it should be coming up on your side. Uh, you, you wanted me just to take you through um, take, take you through my, my slides now? Yes, please. Yes, please. Yeah, yeah. 100%. Um, So you, you see my screen now? We've got it. Uh, so yeah, just you need to make it full screen because it's just on what we do, but it's like the slideshow presentation. Oh, uh, yeah, sure. That better? We got you clearly, yeah. Okay. Well, you've um, you have pretty much covered you know, what we do, uh, Scott, but um, in essence, I'd say you know, we educate our clients about why, how, and you know where the markets are moving. and to, in order to empower them to optimize the, the exchange transaction. So we have focused on rand versus dollar, euro, and pound, um, but we are expanding 
expanding to other financial markets, been you know major currencies, precious metals as well as cryptos. Um, <clears throat> okay, just uh, the normal disclaimer stuff that we need to to uh, to have because we haven't got a crystal ball. Um, but what? Just I thought I'd just share these two slides here. Why it's it's, it's important that we get an objective view as to where the market's going because um, this picture here shows how we tend to exchange at the wrong time. Um, here you can see this is the, the, the blue here is our net investment position. So it's, uh, it's South Africans investing offshore less minus um, a, a foreigners investing onshore. And as you can see here, when the RAND was strong, everyone was bringing funds in. And when the RAND was weak, everyone was taking funds out. And it, what it should have been was exactly the opposite way around. So that's why it's, it is critical for us to have a, a picture of that because, as you said earlier, Scott, uh, the markets are driven by emotions. They're not, you know, fundamentals play a small role, but, um, the markets are driven. What you're seeing there with the RAND movements is, is, is emotion. And what happens is that these extremes is that our emotions are telling us to tell exact, to do exactly the wrong thing. So, you know, when we had at the beginning of 2016, um, at this point, I think I even heard you, Scott, saying, that uh, you, you think the RAND, we might even see the RAND at 50. I heard some others saying maybe 100. Um, but it, everyone was RAND negative here. And our emotions were telling us that. But what we should have been doing at that point is actually getting into RANDs. Um, <clears throat> so as Warren Buffett said, you know, be fearful when others are greedy and greedy when others are fearful. So, um, <clears throat> Just to, to give you a picture as to you know how those sentiment patterns play out, it's just like we've got you know ebb and tide of of and um, growth and decay day and night in financial markets. We've also got these cycles that happen, and it's just a case of finding where we are in these cycles to give us an idea of where the market's going. So perhaps just to give us go back and have a look at our last two webinars. Um, this is what we gave uh, listeners back then in February 2016 when the RAND had just peaked. We expected to move down into the 14 to 1050 area over the next couple of years um, before that bottomed out and we pushed higher. And, you know, at this point, no one was talking that sort of language, but um, you know, we've, we've, that's happened. Um, and at that same point, I think we are sitting just below 16 at that point, you're 1586. And this is what we showed for the next few months, which, um, you know, it doesn't always work out that way, but that's, that's exactly what happened. And then last year, um, April, when we did this webinar, we had had this move down to about 1230 and what we showed here is that we've we had had this five wave move up. Now we needed a, a correction, and we are now expecting a move back down to about 11.40 to 10.20 area before the market then progressed higher. And um, that was our long term view at that point in time for the next few years. Well. You know where we are. We're actually under 12 um, as of today, but um, I don't think many persons expected that even just uh, a month, month or two back. But um, that's you know that's what's happened. But to give us a, an idea of where to from here, um, this is a chart that we have. You know, we've updated from time to time, and it's it's a, it's the fundamental picture, it's an inflation adjusted um, picture of the RAND um, giving fair value for adjusting for producer price inflation. So we have two lines there from 1957 and 1970 
and that comes in at just below 10 to about 12, 1270. And you can see that 12, that red line there, it pretty much comes in at that trend line for this full period since 1970. So that's, um, on average, we've been depreciating at 5.6%. But you can say fair value is somewhere between there and about 10, 1070 for the RAND. So we went way over fair value of now we've come back into fair value area. But as you can see, this doesn't explain these big swings, which is the sentiment that's been driving it. So just to update that picture, um, where we are now is we, we had this, if you look at our, our classic um, cycle, we've had these five waves up here to that 1781, these five waves, and we've now been in a, this counter trend move, move which is a, a partial retracement of this move up. And that is normally a three-wave, three-step move, of which we've had one, two, and we're now into the third one. But um, as you can see there, that we that isn't complete. We actually need this this leg to actually head down, and our our new um, projections is probably. Um, below 11, possibly down to even below nine into this area. We'd have to, you know, as the market progresses, but this is what we're looking for the balance of this year. Um, if we look a bit, um, wait, let me just go back here. So for our long-term outlook, we're now expecting to head down to the 1090 to 865 area. And I expect that to happen before this year end. So over the next few months, it's looking like we've possibly have bottomed out for the meantime and expected to head up towards 13, 13, 20 sort of area. And then over, over the, the, the months thereafter, head down to 11, 39 and below. So, um, now that's pretty much our outlook on the the rand, um, and it's not just the rand itself. It's 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 a it's a function of the dollar. And if you had a look at the dollar, Scott, but um, the dollar itself has been weakening um, over this the same period. So the dollar has had that across the board as well. Um, and I perhaps can just show that to you here. That from about the same time early to or early last year we've we've now had a five wave move of the dollar weakening and there should be some retracement over some coming months up here but the dollar itself is expected you know to weaken as well for the balance of uh, of 2018 um, although we should have some correction also What's that against, as managers? The dollar. What's that tracked against? Um, that, that's a basket of currencies. Okay. Yeah. So it's it's a dollar index against you know all, all the yeah you know, the major currencies that um, the US does does trade with. Yeah. yeah so it's, okay. um, you, you'd you'd see that the euro would be a reversal. At, you know the inverse of this that the um, you know, the euro has gained against the dollar. So it's not just a RAND story, but it's, um, it's a dollar story as well. Okay. Tell us, um, uh, James, I know you've got some slides um, on the cryptocurrency side. Should we, should we go to Andrew and come back to those just now? I think so. That, that might be a good, good thing to okay. do. So we cover the RAND side and then we can go on to cryptos. Cool. It's fine. Uh, right, Andrew, I'm coming over to you. Okay. So, guys, just to, just quickly as an intro, while while Andrew is uh, connecting there, I basically have, again worked with Sable. Ironically, um, 
<laughs> the, the first company that I, I started, my first company in London in 1999 called First Contact. And, um, and you know, Sable was, was part of that group and, and now the entire group is called Sable. And so I've, I've literally worked with them for nearly 20 years now. Um, I was using them to move my money, you know, many, many years ago when I was, uh, you know, I lived in London for nine years. And more recently, in the last 10 years, they've really been our primary um, partner in terms of helping people move money. Now, don't get me wrong, anyone can go in the banks, anyone can ask your bank to move money. But I, I use Sable, and ironically, I literally spoke to uh, a, an investor this morning about this. I use them personally, Kelly and I use them, and we use them at the company for two reasons. One is that when things go wrong, they actually care and they, they get things fixed because I've learned one thing in life, like it's not what you do when it's working, it's what you do when it's not working. And, and it's really important to have a partner that understands the urgency, particularly when you're dealing in real estate. And the second thing that's really important is that, you know, I don't have to sort of do all these price point checks and everything else because I know that I'm getting a good deal. And, and without fail, whenever I've checked against the bank, I've actually stopped doing it. Um, you know, I use Standard Bank and um, they, it's just better every time. So, I, you know, that's, that's the reason we use it. But with, without further ado, Andrew, I wanted to hand over to you because I'm sure you can explain Sable a bit better than I can. Scott, thanks very much. Um, it's always nice being introduced by you. It makes me feel good and uh, good to hear that my staff are still delivering the service. Um, yeah, it's all about service and price. Um, anyway, I'm sure just looking at the attendees, there are a lot of you on this evening and um, thanks very much for your time. Um, for those of you that don't know uh, Sable International or myself, um, Sable International, we've been around for many years. We, we headquartered in that lovely city of London. Um, but luckily, I'm based at our Cape Town office, and um, I look after our global uh, forex business. So just a little bit about what I'm going to chat about this evening is I'm not going to focus too much on, on the actual logistics of sending money out, but I'll just um, touch on some of the allowances and just talk a little bit um, about how we got to where we are with the RAND at the moment, and what I'm sort of seeing on the ground and the sentiment and, and, and what people are telling me. And, and then I'll just share with you some views on, on where I think it's going to be going for the next uh, uh, six months to a year. But just uh, in a quick nutshell, Sable International, our Sable Forex division, um, we, look after, we look after private individuals and, and companies. I'd say 80% of our foreign exchange turnover is actually private individuals who are making offshore investments, whether that's from SA upwards or from the UK to Australia. We've got clients all over the world. Uh, we've been in business for 23 years. We've got over 70,000 registered clients using our Forex. And um, we do over 150,000 individual transactions per annum, totaling about uh, 250 uh, million pounds in trade. So it's about 4.3 billion. And that, that's just on our RAND desk. So that'll give you an idea. Just to let you know, in, in, um, in November, we actually broke the 1 billion rand mark. We sent over a billion rand out of South Africa in November 2017, just before the elections. So, I mean, you know, I was saying earlier, the rand's uh, leak outlook, I mean, you know, everybody's always very rand negative. I think it's, it's, it's always a dinner party discussion. We don't talk about the rand in Cape Town anymore. We're talking about the water crisis, but uh, once we've got water, I'm sure we'll be talking about the rand again. Um, my, my view is that uh, as long as South Africa is, is an unattractive place for long-term capital investment and we have an unproductive labor force, I think that uh, the RAND will continue, the RAND index will continue to devalue around about 7 to 8% against a basket of hard currencies over the long term. And I think if you had a look at that slide earlier of James's, that will certainly confirm that. And that's been a trend over the last couple of decades. Um, so what I'll do is um, drill into a couple of the structural problems that have caused a lot of our short-term anxiety and some of the things that we can be looking forward to uh, going forward. So how did we get to this position? I mean, there are three sort of spheres that affect our currency, and, and this really affects any currency. As you, you look at your political landscape, you look at your, your social uh, landscape, and then, of course, the economy. And um, I think we'll all agree in South Africa that politically we've had a terrible 10 years, um, you know, and it's really escalated in the last couple of years. There's been a lot of um, very blatant um, theft of, of uh, state resources. I think people just became exasperated. We all became quite despondent. We didn't think anything would be done. A little glimmer of hope at the moment since um, 
since uh, Sir Ramaphosa was was elected, but we must remember he's still only the deputy president. So we've still got to go through the process of dealing with um, the current state president. Um, state capture, the Guptas, the so-called, you know, Zupta gate, um, massive destruction of value in our state-owned enterprises, which is which has created a, a big problem for our economy. Um, not only the institutions like the, you know, our legal system and the constitution being attacked, but actual state-owned enterprises like ESCOM and, and our water affairs, where there's been so little in, investment into infrastructure. And we're starting to really see the, the effects of that coming through now. Um, the recent grand strength running up to, to the December election was very much in line with um, emerging market trends. So, you know, I think we were being sort of buoyed along by that. And um, you saw an immediate um, sort of appreciation in Rand value once Cyril was actually um, elected. And that, that election went off very well. It, you know, there was no violence or any, any sort of shenanigans. And, and so we saw a strengthening of the Rand, which we were expecting. I think irrespective of who got in after Jacob Zuma, the Rand would have strengthened in the short term. Um, but I think with Cyril in now, um, we've got probably a more medium term uh, strengthening pattern. And I think we really all going to be watching him to see what kind of leader he's going to turn out to be. Obviously, um, you know, we still have high inflation in South Africa. So, you know, they tell us it was 6% last year, but everything that we buy has certainly gone up by more than 6%. And that has a very real impact on on um, on what we as South Africans can afford to buy on a monthly basis and our disposable income, and that that again is rand negative because what happens is um, is people have less and less money to spend, and and that slows the economy down. And then uh, we had a really bad commodity slump, um, you know, sort of three four years ago, and last year we saw a muted sort of recovery in uh, in commodities, and that's been rand positive because we are a commodity economy. Although our mining sector is not in great, um, not in a great space at the moment, um, it's certainly better than it was sort of 18 months ago. We still have um, very militant labour. We have very high unemployment, low productivity, and and that's that's always really rad negative. And and over the last year, we've really seen it, particularly a very very um, fractious relationship between big business and government. And what's interesting is. You know, business has been pinging government for a long time. And um, what's happened now is we've had a couple of big stories like Steinhoff and the KPMGs. I see there was something about Capitec today in the news. And big business is not really doing itself any favors either. And that's really giving the politicians quite a lot of a lot of leeway. And, um, you know, I think it was Gwedi Mantash who said in December, look, it's not only government who's corrupt, the private sector is corrupt too. But the good thing was, at least he was admitting um, that the government is corrupt. <laughs> so if you have a look at um, at this slide, I mean, that's really just a nice infographic for you. This is particularly the rand against the pound. And as I'm speaking, the pound is sitting at 1693. Um, incidentally, it's at 1197 to a dollar and 1485 to a euro. But what I'm trying to reflect with this graph over the last sort of 18 years is that that is essentially the cost price of a pound if you're a RAND-based investor or, or buyer. So if you're buying anything that was a pound-based cost, that is how the fluctuation and the underlying cost of that product is going to be. And I think if you're an importer or an exporter and you've got an income or a cost line that is that volatile, it becomes extremely risky to your business. And equally as a private investor, to make a, a, a considered investment decision to go and invest offshore, with that type of volatility subject to these incredible sort of sentiment driven swings, it makes it really difficult. So what we want to try and sort of show you um, as, as listeners is, you know, whenever the RAND blows out, we're extremely negative. But if you look at it, it always does come back and it comes back to its long term trend line. Um, unless we become a failed state, I think that's going to always continue. So next time it goes to 24 to a pound, for heaven's sake, don't send your money out. Just wait, because it will always come back. And when it's sitting at 1693, like it is today, use the opportunity and, and send some money offshore. And again, that's um, just, it, it, it's James. James, sorry, Scotty. I was just saying, my mom did that in 2001 when the rand went to 20 rand to the pound. She sent money off. I brought pounds home and bought Callaway golf clubs. But anyway, <laughs> that. 
Well, if golf clubs ever were an investment, I think that was it. <laughs> um, so where do we go from here? Again, looking at the three, um, you know, the three spheres of social, political, and economic. Um, I think what what I would I would be looking out for that's going to have an effect on us as an economy and the RAND, particularly against all those hard currencies, is what does our trade balance look like? We we as a country need to be exporting more than we import so that we can build up our foreign reserves. And uh, the RAND is quite strong at the moment. So suddenly the exporters are feeling a bit of pressure. Their products become expensive. So that's going to reduce demand. And we'll probably start seeing the RAND um, weakening off um, you know, due to that lack of exports. And we'll start seeing people probably importing more. It's a good time if you want to bring a, a, a nice uh, luxury item from overseas. Now is probably not a bad time to be making that purchase. Um, our gross domestic product, uh, we, 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 we've got very muted um, forecasts of economic growth. That's not good news. Our um, population is increasing faster than our economic growth, so that's negative. Um, commodity prices, we're hoping, um, will continue to, to recover, albeit slowly. And unemployment's the one big flag that, that um, we just don't seem to be able to fix. You know, unemployment um, is, is a real stubborn problem in South Africa. Um, our inflation, we, you know, we're running within our 3 to 6% target. So I think from a monetary policy point of view, the, the Reserve Bank are fairly happy. Um, we are classified as an emerging market. And an emerging market um, is defined by an economy that's showing extraordinary growth and industrialization. And I don't think South Africa is showing extraordinary growth at all. Um, so I think that we're one of the weaker emerging market um, players, frankly. And industrialization is something that we should be um, looking to grow. And uh, until we've got a more stable and attractive political environment, I don't think we're going to see a massive industrialization drive. And we've also got expensive labor. But it depends on 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 the new leadership of, of the ruling party as to, as to what policies they're going to put in in the next three or four years, I think is going to really determine how we as a country go forward. Um, currently, South Africa's still got one of the highest money market rates in the world, although interest rates are increasing um, in, in the in the so-called sort of developed world and the hard currency markets. Um, the, the relative difference is still very high, so it makes the South African Rand a very attractive currency for people to park short-term money. You know, if you've got money sitting in, in a euro bank account, you're earning 0%. If you put it into the South African money market, you can earn up to 8 to 8.5%. And the thing about that money is that whilst it's making a short-term high yield, the minute things get rocky here and the RAND starts to devalue, they can uh, liquidate those positions very quickly and that money can run out the market. And that's one of the things that causes a lot of these short-term swings in the RAND value is that when people get negative, you get that herd mentality and we'll start seeing big outflows. And then when the RAND's really weak again, those fund managers start sort of coming back into the market and you'll see the RAND strengthening again. Again, it's just that human investment emotion. Sura Ramaphosa and power, I think that's a big positive. I really do. Um, I don't think that um, if, if Sura Ramaphosa was running in the UK, I would vote him in. He's a, you know, he's a very strong communist. He's a labor unionist. But in the South African context, I think he's the best of, 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 the, of the bunch. And um, I really do think that he realizes that he's got to do something to attract investment and, and, and get some growth going. I think he's going to have a lot of opposition internally, um, but let's just watch that space. But I do think that medium term, that's very RAND positive, and I think that's good for the South African economy. We know about the size under collection. I mean, that's that's been very well documented. They're talking about 50 billion RAND. We knew it would happen. They're just simply spending, the government is spending too much money on, on wasteful expenditure, and the tax, the tax, um, tax base is shrinking. And... Um, one of the ways they're looking to possibly sort of plug this gap is to increase VAT by 2%. Um, and that is something that could come out in, in the budget in the next couple of weeks. And um, I think if VAT does go up by 2%, you know, life for all of us goes up by 2%. It's going to put a lot of pressure on consumers. It's going to probably um, get a little bit of a political reaction as well. But it, in all likelihood, they're talking about raising sort of 45 billion rand if they increase VAT. So I think that's something that we should be looking out for. Then we, we, we mustn't forget about the junk status, um, the junk status sort of road that we're on. Two, two of the rating agencies have got us 
um, under under uh, sub investment grade, and Moody's have been quite light on us, and they're waiting until until the budget um, in the next coming weeks to make a decision on on how they're going to how they're going to rate us going forward. I have to say they've they've put out some quite positive statements um, since Sura Ramaphosa has come in. I think changing the ESCOM board has been very positive, um, and let's see what he carries on with. If there are going to be any any um, moves against the the, the, the so-called state capturers and um, and hopefully we start seeing some um, prosecutions and some people going to jail. I think that'll be really good because I think it'll just show that a sign that we really are not going to put up with um, this ongoing corruption and, and blatant theft. Um, the one thing to note is that if we do get further downgraded, um, South Africa will need to, will, will, will be removed as an investment destination from the World Global Bond Index. And uh, we sort of estimate that around about 10 billion Rand or $10 billion, sorry, around about 150 billion Rand could leave the market in the short term. And that is fund, fund managers who are running funds that have rules that say, you can't invest the funds of this particular fund into an emerging into a market that is sub investment grade. So two out of three we we sub investment grade, but if all three of them put us under the under the line, then we're going to see a big outflow. That will see a a short to medium term collapse in the rand. I'm hoping that's not going to happen. And then one thing I think we you know everybody's not really taking the water crisis in Cape Town um, very seriously. I don't think the water crisis in Cape Town is in itself a, a major issue for the economy, but I think it's just a, it's a very apparent crack. And I think it's pretty representative of what's happening in the rest of the country. If, if, if there's a lack of rainfall anywhere in the country, I think we could, we could see other cities going down the same, the same road in future. And, and I think a lot of our other infrastructures under pressure. So I think what we should be learning from the water crisis in Cape Town is that we as a country need to start investing in infrastructure to develop with um, with the economic growth that we that we need to be seeing, so um, Sir Ramaphosa has got a big uh, a big to do list, and uh, let's see what he does. So just very quickly, I'm not going to spend time on the slide. We all know the rand impact on offshore investments. Um, at the moment, the rand is strong. Um, it's a great time to be investing offshore now. Um, yet everyone's feeling confident, so it's a time when everybody thinks, let's hold our rands. Good time to sell them whilst they're expensive and buy those weaker offshore currencies and make an investment. Um, where should people be investing? We live, in a, we live in a third world economy, an emerging market. And what I would say is from a hedging perspective is look for stable markets uh, where there's governance and laws. Uh, Brexit, there's been a pretty good, uh, what I call the Brexit dividend. Um, much of that's been eroded away now, but with RAND strength, the pound is still uh, relatively weak. And, um, and look for somewhere where you can, in the longer term, earn uh, returns in a hard currency higher than what you'd have with your RAND sitting in, a, in an offshore bank account. And the old saying, live where it's warm and invest where it's cold. Just very quickly, um, not to bore any of you, these um, allowances that South African residents still have um, available to them uh, to take offshore. You can still take a million RAND a year under your so-called discretionary allowance without a tax clearance certificate. And then uh, taxpayers can take a further 10 million for capital investment. So that amounts to 11 million Rand per taxpayer per year, which is a very generous allowance. Um, I don't see that the Reserve Bank or, or the Treasury will look at reducing that in the, in, the, in the short term. But if things do go wrong politically and, and we see a collapse of the Rand, there's, there's, there's no reason why they couldn't reduce that in future. But I don't see that as a, as a, as a big red flag at the moment. Um, we help with uh, processing of the tax clearance certificates, incidentally, if you are looking to move money. And we can also help with uh, special clearances with the Reserve Bank if, if investors are looking to move more than the 10 million per annum. Um, just a little bit of a, an indication of what our clients over the last few years have been sending their money offshore for, and that's according to our reporting. And uh, by far, the, 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 the biggest reason that South Africans move cash offshore for is really for investment into real estate. South Africans do like um, offshore real estate. And um, things to consider when buying offshore, make sure that the people you send your money through are legitimate and that they're regulated. Understand how much you're allowed to take out of the country and also understand the tax 
environment in the in the destination where you're investing and how that relates back to you as a South African taxpayer. Um, I think you've all probably heard of CRS and um, tax authorities are now sharing information. So it's getting more and more difficult to hide assets offshore. So I'd encourage everyone to make sure that you get the right advice before you make an, um, offshore investments um, so that they're both tax efficient and also legal. And then um, make sure that the company or the institution that you're investing into um, on the other side of the ocean is a reputable uh, company, whether it's a real estate company or some sort of fund manager. And um, now that's really just wrapping it up there, Scott. Um, I hope that's that's um, done what you needed it to do and, and given my view for the next six to eight months. And thanks all of you for listening. Awesome. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Andrew, in terms of where, where we are. So I want to, um, if you guys have questions, please just uh, fire through the questions. Um, you'll see this little chat box in the top right corner. So you can literally go in there and, and put questions in. What I want to do is, is just sort of uh, take us back uh, quickly to, to the PowerPoint that, that I was on. Because a question that, that I'm interested in with both of you is also, you know, while, while others are bringing questions through. I've got a couple of questions that I wanted to ask. And you know, what, what are your thoughts on Bitcoin? You know, um, there was a, obviously a, a mad rush last year and it went, you know, wildly up and it went wildly down. You know, what, are, what are your thoughts? Let, let's start with yourself, you know, James, in terms of, you know, what you see and the commonalities between, call it fiat currency and, and cryptocurrency and equally sort of what's happening in the market at the moment. James, you there? James, we're not getting any audio. You hear me now? Yeah, we got yes, you. Yes, Mark. Okay, you got. It. Yeah, as I said earlier, I think you know cryptocurrencies are here to stay. Um, if you look at 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 fiat currencies, they, as I've mentioned before, I mean they, there's a huge problem there is that every fiat currency is actually backed by not by assets but by debt and um that is a massive bubble that at some point in time is going to burst now what um what cryptocurrencies are doing and bitcoin and so on is that actually persons are seeing that risk and saying, well, let me rather invest, use this as a medium of exchange rather than a fiat currency. And I see that, you know, you can see governments are, are concerned about that when we're seeing what the likes of China are doing to try and shut down cryptocurrencies. But um, I, my own feeling is it's here to stay and will in some way or other, you know, replace the the current fiat um, system of of uh, of exchange, um, you know, which is which is really outdated, because you know we've got exchange controls and in terms of transfers and all that sort of thing. Um, cryptos is just a much easier and better way. You're know, using blockchain technology to to handle transfer of of uh, of, of capital. Fantastic. And um, tell me, just before I move to Andrew, in terms of sentiment, and like you said, where you track sentiment, whether it's fiat or crypto, are you noticing hmm. the trends the same? Yeah, maybe I must just share, um, uh, if you want to share a screen, I'll just actually give you a, you know, well, my view of where we are on that. Cool. It's over to you. Um, yeah, I did just go back here, yeah, just, just an interest this, I don't know, we need to yeah, make it a full screen again. Slide, sorry. Yeah. Ah, sorry. Current slide. So just to show you what I was speaking about earlier, um, this is 2016, we haven't got last year, but this is just US debt, total debt. So it's not just government debt as a percentage of GDP. Um, and as you can see here, back in 1929, um, 
that's actually what caused the the Great Depression and the market crash was um, was debt. And we had this collapse here. Now we've had this correction from 20, 2008, but we're still sitting way over where we were were back in 1929. So yeah, the problem hasn't gone away. But um, <laughs> cryptocurrencies might actually just be part of you know that whole bubble bursting. So um, yeah, you can see what happened last year. Just in total money going into cryptocurrencies, we had a growth of 47 times to the peak in uh, in early early January. Just <laughs> it's a massive growth in that cryptocurrency. Is but, that dollar um, based, James? Um, dollar based, yeah. Okay. Yeah, in dollar terms. So you can see how that's that's taken on, but it's still early days in terms of you know to total market capitalization. Um, but if we if we look at the where we started on Bitcoin itself, that um, you know the, the cryptocurrencies are just like any other financial market, driven by those same um, emotions, you know, from one extreme to the other of of fear and despair to you know euphoria and um, and greed, and this is what our current analysis from where we started um, back in 2010 is that if you go back to our five waves up, three waves down, we've had in the long term we've had one, two, three, four, and we now in the fifth wave, long term fifth wave. And it appears like we've got one more wave to go um, <clears throat> before we have a major correction. Now, all of these, it's it's not it's been in 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 uh, the scale is log scale. It's not linear, but all these corrections were. I think this one here was about eighty-seven percent, and this one is also about 80, 80 some odd percent. Now, what I'm expecting is that we'll we'll head up, you know, into you know maybe I don't know. I need to do those projections, but uh, probably four times where we are now. But then, are you saying forty thousand dollars plus? Yeah. Between forty and fifty. But after that, we're going to have a major crash, probably under under three, uh, under four digits. So down to three digits, under a thousand dollars. Wow. Um, yeah. So you know what? What I what I see with this, Scott, is like um, you know, just as we saw the dot com bubble was was um, you know the, the birth of internet. You had all these um, persons climbing on the bandwagon with RPOs then, and we got exactly the same thing happening now with RCOs. And a lot of them are junk, um, but persons are just climbing on because you know there's just money to be made. But um, when we have this crash, you know those that have um, a solid business behind it and are using the blockchain technology um, to add value, you know those ones will will survive, not only survive but thrive. Whereas probably 90% of of coins. Crypto coins will will just disappear. Well, I've got a I've got a very interesting slide to share with you um, when, when you when you're done. But uh, have you, is there another slide there, or can we move to Andrew's perspective on? I know yeah, he's you also can, Yeah, you can go to Andrew. Cool. So so Andrew, from your perspective, um, and it's a pretty good slide. So I'm going to leave it on. Uh, it's better than my slide. <laughs> um, in terms of your, you know, your, your you, you've, you've been doing quite a lot of, you know, you and I have had offline chats around this. You've done quite a lot of um, work in the in the Bitcoin space, and even talking with the Reserve Bank and really trying to understand what's going on. Would you mind sharing your perspective on what on what you find? Yeah, I'll give you a little bit of my my experience. I mean, I think I think that um, look, we've got to look at we've got to look at the sort of Bitcoin as. But you know, Bitcoin's one of many coins, as as I'm sure a lot of uh, a lot of people know. And then you've got the blockchain blockchain technology. So I think 
if, if you separate that out, I think from a technology point of view, the actual um, protocol of, of blockchain, I think is very interesting. And it's very interesting to the banking sector because we we did a pilot with uh, with one of the South African banks and a, and a, a global Bitcoin exchange a couple of years ago, where we, we ran a model on the basis of of using Bitcoin to do retail um, foreign exchange trans transactions over bit, um, uh, over the uh, blockchain technology using Bitcoin, much like the US dollars used in a, in, a, in, a, in a modern day currency transfer. So in essence, what happens if I sell rands now and I buy pounds, there's always a dollar leg behind that currency transfer. So what happens is instead of using the US dollar and the SWIFT system, as as the backing currency and the means of payment using um blockchain and bitcoin what what would happen is instantaneously you sell your rands you buy your bitcoin instantaneously you sell the bitcoin and you buy gbp or british pounds now that's instantaneous where the risk lies is that there's still quite a big um spread between the the the, the buy and the, and the sell spread on the bitcoin but technically what's interesting with the blockchain is that that transaction can happen within 11 minutes and costs 40 US cents. I'll give you an idea that the, 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 a, a normal spot transaction on the SWIFT system costs 45 US dollars and can take two days. So if you just think of that from, from an efficient um, payment system and, and, a, and a ledger based tracking system for international payments, I think blockchain's got a long way to go. I think Bitcoin itself as a commodity or as a, as a, as a currency. So this is, this is the currency we're talking about. Now, when you're talking about a currency, two or three things that you should consider. First of all, as a means of exchange. Now, if I turn around and say, I'm, I'm prepared, I'm, I own a hotel in Las Vegas and I'm going to take Bitcoin as payment. Now, if I take some Bitcoin today as payment and the Bitcoin collapses 100% overnight, that's not really good for my business. So as a means of exchange, it's quite risky because of the volatility at the moment. Um, as a store of value, depending on who you speak to, um, my wife's coffee group bought Bitcoins in the middle of December and they're worth half of what they were when they bought them. So they don't think it's a great store of value. But if you talk to somebody who bought a Bitcoin last April and they're sitting with it now, even after the latest sort of small correction, they've done really well. So. I think that until until um, the, the Bitcoin market settles down and um, there's a lot of risk in it. And then, of course, you, you know, that's another coffee. That's another dinner table discussion at the moment is everybody's jumping into Bitcoin. But I think people are fearful of it because they don't really understand it. And um, the other thing that I think one should also recognize is that, you know, governments like to collect tax. And the problem with Bitcoin at the moment is it's very difficult to track transactions. Um, you know, for tax authorities and central banks. And that is why governments don't particularly like Bitcoin. Um, I know at the moment there's a massive opportunity. Um, if you're living in South Africa and you send money offshore and you buy um, not necessarily just a Bitcoin, any of these cryptocurrencies and uh, like Ethereum, you can buy a coin on an exchange in Europe and you can instantaneously sell it in South Africa. And you can make up to 20% profit just on that arbitrage. And the the reason is that pricing differential is because of South African exchange control. So in a way, exchange control has created this pricing differential, which is, which has created a nice um, money making opportunity. But there are all sorts of tax incentives. We're busy taking um, opinions at the moment. And if you sell a Bitcoin and you make a profit, they, they're looking at that as a capital gain. I personally think it should be reflected as part of your income. Um, but that's that's all happening and the authorities have kind of just been sitting on these questions and not dealing with it but i see today it was reported that the reserve bank has now um put up a task team of two or three techie people that they've employed and they really are going to be looking at it closely and what i've also noticed i've got a client who's a very big bitcoin miner and he owns a couple of exchanges and he's looking to enter the south african market and he wants um reserve bank approval and he wants fsb approval so th this is a disruptive currency that came in to try and knock over the, the existing financial uh, system. But actually what's happening is the people who are playing in it want to be regulated because they want to make money out of it. And I think the reason that countries like China are, are, are making it illegal is because a lot of their citizens are, are losing a lot of money um, speculating. And uh, so, you know, the, it, it, what's happening in South Africa, a lot of people have lost money buying Bitcoin. 
And the first thing they do is they phone the financial services board and say, you know, we bought bitcoins and we've been ripped off, but it's a scam. And it turns out that it's some offshore provider. They're not protected. So there, there are lots of reasons why I think it's going to become um, more regulated. And then it's, it's also a great way for people to launder money and to dodge exchange control. And uh, authorities are all very aware of that. So um, legitimate players in the space, I think, are going to embrace um, regulation. So I think, as James says, and you, Scotty, I mean, this it's not going to go away. It's, it's been seen. It's not, you can't hide it anymore. Um, I just think it's, it's, it's something that will settle down and quite how it all looks, I don't really know. But it's an exciting space. And I think that um, people who embrace the technology could do really well. Well, guys, I mean, look, I, I want to share something with you. And for those who don't know, we've actually, I'm, I'm doing a webinar with David Orban tomorrow night, and I'm doing another one on the 6th of February. And it's interesting, James, because you spoke about the correlations between the tech boom and bust, the internet boom and bust, and, and, and you know, the, the cryptocurrency market. I wanted to just share with you, you know, you mentioned the word ICOs, uh, James, and there's over, my understanding is there's now somewhere between 1,000 and 2,000 cryptocurrencies. But I wanted to share with you this graph because this is absolutely astounding of what has happened since 2014 uh, over the last three years. So this is ICOs, which stand for initial coin offerings. And this is the amount of money that was invested, uh, and again, per country. And you can see in the top left corner how much money has been uh, invested. So we we pretty much at the end of 2014, and it's $36 million. And you can see sort of how many ICOs there are. Uh, watch the watch the sort of the growth in uh, in 2016. So you can see Ethereum, most people have now heard of Ether, which is sort of the, the, the little brother to, to Bitcoin. So you can see that 19 million. So we're up to $45 million, and that's the end of 2016. Okay. And uh, you can start to see as we go into 2017. I'm oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, this is the end of 2016 now. So we're up to two, what's that, 300, 315 million. And then now watch what happens in 2017. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's incredible. I think you get the point. Yeah. Amazing. <laughs> um, and, uh, and, and, you know, James, this, this comes very much to your point that you know, I, I completely agree with you that 90% of these are, are going to fail. And just like in the internet, you know, boom, there was a lot of rubbish out there. And, and most importantly, there were businesses that weren't built on fundamentals. But when the internet market crashed, when we had the dot-com bust, what happened was that Alibaba, eBay, uh, Amazon, Google, uh, Salesforce, and, and many of the others where the sound fundamentals were in place, actually not only, as you've already said, James, not only survived, but actually went on to thrive and, and really dominate. So, you know, the question I've got for you guys quickly is, why do you think there's been such a growth in 2017 in that crypto space? Is it, is it purely hype? Is it purely what you said? And I mean, to either of you, is it, is it purely that sort of missile syndrome and your wife at, at a coffee club wanting to be part of it? I think so. I think, um, I think, um, it it is it's become frenetic. I mean, everybody's everybody's in, um, dabbling in it. Whether they're putting five hundred rand or we have a client who got a clearance for ten million rand the other day, um, you know, to to put into Bitcoin, and it, it's prolific the growth. And I think it, it's the, you know there's an undersupply, um, or, or 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 deemed or perceived undersupply. You know, I think it's getting more and more difficult to to mine Bitcoin. Um, I think they're about. I think about 11 of the 22 odd million have been mined to date. I might be slightly out there, Scott. I don't know if you know the the, the exact figures, but as as more and more coins are mined, the, the remaining ones become more and more difficult. So I think that the cost to mine these things is becoming higher and higher. So I think that's also a factor. Um, but yeah, I think it's I think it's a bubble, personally. There's one other factor, James, just before you jump in, that I only learned now when I was in Vegas at Coin Agenda. But every sort of four or five years, they actually halve the amount of Bitcoins you get when, you, when you're mining. And that actually happened at the back end of 2016. Uh, and it's going to happen again in uh, either 2020 or 2021. I, I need to double check on that. But um, 
again, I mean, something David Orban could answer for us, but it, it, it fundamentally impacted the supply side, which is exactly what you're referring to, Andrew. Uh, James, from your perspective? Yeah, well, it, yeah it comes down to, to, to sentiment. Um, you know, and that's what we're looking at there in that, that picture we showed you, is that when you, when you get to an extreme of an extreme, so on at, at uh, where we Bitcoin started in 2010, we sit in 2018 now, and we probably in the last wave of that final move up. And that what happens in that period is, you know, it's just herd mentality and euphoria. Everyone believes it's impossible to actually lose on, uh, you know, on on this particular market, and it just looks like we may have, you know, one one last push up um, before that bubble bursts. And well, I thought that, you know, that, that was happened good. in every market. James, I thought that was a good lead in for you because the next question was, should I invest or wait for the crash? And it's interesting <laughs> based on your graph, like. You know, I know you're not a fortune teller, and, and to be very clear for everyone, this is not financial advice. But um, you know, what what is your sentiment on it? Yeah, if you if you're looking personally, you know, it, it's an opportunity now for um, if you're totally talking Bitcoin itself. Um, I think there might be opportunity the next few months, um, but there'll definitely be a, a better opportunity. Down the road, to um, I'd, I wouldn't uh, I don't know if I'd be hold I wouldn't definitely hold on for the long term um, at this point. Um, so but you, perhaps in a few months you have a, have a good selling opportunity and you'll be able to buy multiples of that um, when the market when the market crashes. So I mean, Andrew, if I if I ask you the next question, you know, you, you highlighted quite a few of the risks in your in your presentation. But if you were to say, you know, for, for all of us that are online, you know, what, what would you say are the top sort of two or three risks that we need to look out for? And I'm not talking in cryptos. I'm talking generally in 2018. Um, yeah, I think, uh, I think we've got to watch. Uh, we've probably got to keep a little eye on Donald Trump. I think he's, he's an interesting – I think he's, he seems to be a real saber rattler, whether he'll follow through. But, uh, you know, there seems to be a little bit more diplomacy between him and – and um, and the North Koreans at the moment, um, but I think that that's certainly uh, something that we should be looking out for. And um, yeah, just just watch out for that debt in in the in the in, you know in, in all the hard in, in all the developed markets. There's a lot of debt, and I've spoken to many economists, and nobody really knows how that bond buying spree of the last seven or eight years is really going to play out in the longer term. So. You know, I think just just be careful and make sure that wherever you're investing, depends what your risk appetite is, is um, just be really careful and take some good advice. Because I still think that it's quite a flaky kind of recover, recovery that, we, that we've that we experienced. And I think there's still a, a lot of risk lying around out there. James, before I move on to you with the opportunities, there's this guy actually, um, Jim Rogers, a uh, road investment biker, He's got the world record for traveling more countries in the world on a motorbike. And one of his more recent books, uh, you know, it's probably a year or two old now, it's called Street Smarts. Um, I met him through my uncle. My uncle started the Botswana Stock Exchange uh, back in the early 90s. And my, my uncle met him, and I've had lunch with him twice. And it's really interesting, Andrew, what you say, because he reckons that if you look back in the history of, of economies, every eight years or so, there's a correction. And, you know, when you start looking at the timing, we are – <laughs> We, we have it yet. We're beyond our eight years. It's a very simple, and and it can be whatever. You know, the last one was because of the housing crisis. The one before that was because of the internet crisis. It doesn't matter. It's, it's cyclical, which sort of comes back to to what James is saying. And so, you know, for me as an investor, I think it's very important to be prudent, uh, to go to the fundamentals, which which uh, you said earlier, Andrew, and to make sure that you that whatever you invest in, you're preparing for a correction as well. Um, and to some extent, that brings me on to the last question, which. You know, uh, James. You know, what, what, where, where do you see opportunity in 2018? You know, do we do we all go and bury ourselves and wait for the crash, or where do you see opportunity? <laughs> that, that's a that's a difficult question. Um, <clears throat> you know, on, on the local on the local market, um, you know, strangely enough, that the the 
opportunity is on the RAND front. Um, perhaps not the next month or two, but um, further on from there, you know, you, if we're looking at the RAND going to 11 and, and below, uh, after heading towards 13, there's opportunity to, to make some money there. Um, possibly, um, yeah, on, on, on cryptos, definitely you need to, to be looking at some opportunities there, not just at Bitcoin, because, um, you know, there's some of these other um, cryptos that have got a, a solid business um, behind them. And although all of them will, will, will have a correction when there's a crash, um, you know, I don't think some of them will have the same as Bitcoin because they haven't been around as long. Um, but you'd need to have a look at, at uh, each one of those in terms of the, the fundamentals of those, that business. But of course, um, you know, your own situation, um, Scott, in terms of property, um, then I'm sure there are, there are opportunities now with, uh, you know, with the, the RAND stronger to invest in some property. Um, but again, you need to look at um, where you're investing and that uh, it's priced right because I'm quite sure that there's probably another, um, you know, some housing price correction coming in the not too distant not too distant future. Um, and one thing I'd definitely keep away from is is stocks because we we as you we overdue for a correction there. But, um, so guys, there's lots of. I can share. Sorry, say that again, James. No, I said that's about as much as I can share. <clears throat> oh, awesome! Listen, there's um there's lots of uh, questions um coming through. I just want to quickly um because I am conscious of the time. I wanted to share something that um, that I learned uh, two years ago. I was very privileged to meet Ray Kurzweil. And when we're looking at the future, uh, this guy has, over the last 30 years, had an accuracy higher than 86% in terms of predicting where we're going, uh, specifically in the technology space. And um, there's a great uh, graph, of, well, not graph, what do you call it, image, on some of the predictions he's got coming. And I actually had the privilege of meeting him uh, two years ago at uh, A360 in, in, in uh, Los Angeles. And um, my point being is that he taught me something that was really interesting. He said, if you want to really thrive, and, and I'm not talking in the next 12 months, I'm talking with five, 10, 20 years out, you've got to look for long-term trends. And you've got to look for long-term trends that are intersecting. So all night you've heard Andrew and James talking about long-term trends. And as an investor, as an entrepreneur, as someone that wants to take control of your financial destiny, you need to be able to look for those long-term trends. You need to look for the intersection point, and that's where the opportunity lies. And a good example he gave was that if you take the cell phone here, you know, um, the guys that invented Siri um, literally went and they said, well, listen, there's going to be voice recognition, there's going to be artificial intelligence, and there's a massive boom in smartphones. So they built Siri, and in less than two years, they sold it for literally hundreds of millions of dollars uh, to Apple which is a classic example of spotting where the future is going. And, you know, from my, from my perspective, I believe there's eight major trends that you need to look out for. The first one is gamification and learning while doing. It's going to fundamentally change the education system in terms of how people don't want to go on a course or go on coaching. They want to learn while doing. The second thing is blockchain and cryptocurrencies. We've spoken a lot about it tonight, but it's fundamentally going to change the way that people operate. It's going to increase trust. It's going to reduce friction costs massively. Social commerce and collaborative investing, you know, in the past, it was all about us individuals doing it on our own. Now working together, we're going to get increased returns and reduce the risk. Personalization, you know, it's all been, you know, financial products that we that we read about in newspapers and on TV, but we're just a number. You know, people now want personal solutions for them and their families. They want to have the power to create the freedom in their lives, and they want to have a meaningful connection with their investments. There's a rise of a middle class in the emerging markets, and, you know, something that's exciting for all of us is that 3 billion people are unbanked and are joining the global economy in the next 10 years. And this is going to be dramatically impacted by mobile adoption and internet connectivity. Globalization. You know, a lot of what we've spoken about tonight is, is local volatility of investors wanting to be diversified across countries, assets, and currencies. The seventh one is social pressure to democratize access to wealth and really empower the 99%. 
You know, the, the statistics are disgusting and, and they continue to get worse every single year with the amount of wealth held by the top 1%. And the only reason is, is that the top 1% are doing things different from the 99%. And hopefully tonight has been about empowering people so they can make the right decisions. And then lastly, investors want to have a purposeful impact and they want to co-create the planet that they want. So, you know, for me, you need to look at these eight trends. You need to say, okay, well, putting these into perspective, where are they going to intersect? Where does the opportunity lie? Where are things going? And, you know, before we get into just some of that q and I I want to share with you a personal story because 10 years ago, we had the last crash uh, at the back end of 2008. And in 2009, I met Henny Besaidnode and Peter Fenstra, and we were in Bondi Beach in Sydney, and they were buying medical buildings. And I remember saying to them, I'd helped over 2,500 people buy houses and apartments in England, Australia, America, and South Africa. And I remember saying, why medical? And they said, Scott, think about it. No matter what happens in the economy, <laughs> oh, sorry, no matter what happens in the economy, people need doctors. Secondly, doctors never leave their premises. And thirdly, doctors are not accountants. They're going to sign long-term favorable leases. And I remember thinking to myself, that is an absolute no-brainer. And, you know, when you consider a trend like that, you know, medical, particularly in the first world, is a growing trend with the baby boomers, you know, really starting to, to reach retirement. Another major trend is, 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 is in terms of when you look at the opportunity now of how you can use technology. I mean, this... This is a medical building we bought in 2014, and I don't know, James or Andrew, if you know this, but we bought this, this portfolio from, from investors on five different continents. And what's really exciting is we've now, we, we spoke of a portfolio deal where we were going to buy up small, um, small groups of units, and we were going to bring them together, and our exit strategy was to sell them onto a REIT. Well, we currently are going through that process uh, of exiting medical one, two, three, and five uh, to a REIT. And, and, and really, you know, in, in three years, not five years, delivering on the results. And my point is, is that there are long-term trends. There are fundamentals to investing. And people make money when they sell to REITs. But we need to be higher up the value chain. And then lastly, you know, cryptocurrency is extremely, uh, you know, it's going to have an impact on your life, whether you like it or not. And tomorrow night, we're going to talk a lot around blockchain. And if you don't know what blockchain is, I highly, highly recommend you look into it. It's going to have a bigger impact on your life than the Internet has over the last 20 years. But, you know, James, you mentioned one of the things that people need to look for is they need to look for an existing business with existing fundamentals. And three years ago, we said, well, Bitcoin's wonderful, but it's not really based on anything. Imagine if we could have a cryptocurrency that was actually based on real estate. It was based on an asset class everyone understands. So it's not going to have the volatility, neither the up nor the down of, of Bitcoin, because it's based on, on an asset class that people understand. And I mean, we, we, again, tonight's not the point. And again, tomorrow night, I'll go into this in more detail, but we are currently in the process of launching uh, the wealthy coin to allow people to participate in cryptocurrencies, but based on the fundamentals of an asset class people understand. And so, you know, just to give you some, some, some ideas, tomorrow night, we've got David Orban. Um, it'll be at the same time. He's literally, I'm not going to play you this blockchain video. I'll play it to you tomorrow night. It's one of the most important things you need to know about. But David Orban was the very first person to invest in Ether. He's a venture capitalist out of, uh, out of New York. He's a faculty member of Singularity University. That's one of the most advanced universities in the world. And he's a global authority on blockchain and crypto. And he's going to give us his view on, and, and there were a lot of questions tonight around, you know, which exchanges and which are the top five cryptocurrencies, et cetera. You know, he, he's, he's, he's the guy that, that can answer that. The other thing that I think is important is that in February, we've got some live events around South Africa. In, in, in Durban, in Johannesburg, and in Cape Town on the 20th, 21st, and 22nd. And Clem Sunter will also be coming. And, you know, he talks a lot about the scenario plan. And, you know, I've always worked very closely with Andrew and James and Clem to help people make the right decisions for them and their future. And then in March, uh, David's actually coming out to South Africa. So we're going to be running a number of exponential technology and crypto investing um, workshops. Um, so we're doing them in March in Seoul, Manila, Tokyo, and Puerto Rico. And then at the end of March, we're coming to South Africa. And again, the 24th, 27th, and 28th of March. And we'll also be doing private wealth partner dinners uh, with David um, on the 24th, 26th, and 28th. And so I think that just gives everyone a sort of an idea of, of what is happening. And I know that we've run up a bit over time, but I just wanted people to have an understanding. The last thing I wanted to say is that if you want to go on our platform, um, we really work with with the, the, the two gentlemen we've spoken about tonight so that you can have the right information. But if you want to go on our platform, you can now invest 
you know, getting access to the best partners and the best opportunities. You can get access to the, to the research and you can invest from as little as a thousand rand or a hundred dollars. And, you know, you no longer have the hassles of management, maintenance, complex global tax structures. And the last thing I'll say to you is that we're in the process of launching our wealthy coin. And anyone that is actually registered on the Wealth Migrate platform is going to be given uh, wealthy coins. And they're also not going to have to go through the whole KYC process, etc. So if you're interested, I, I highly recommend. And the last thing I wanted to share with you, which really ties the whole webinar together tonight, is that what we've discussed tonight and, and what we've shared is that, and I'm very, very grateful that Andrew and James have given up their time to share with you, is that we've worked closely with both, you know, both parties uh, for the last 10 years. But what we really want to do is that you can see Wild Migrate is sitting over here. We're building the Wealthy Exchange. We've got GIDS, which is our global investment due diligence system. And what we want to do in the very near future is be tying in all of James's reports, tying in all the research that, that Andrew has shared, have the flexibility to be able to invest directly with a swap of a finger from your mobile phone. And this is the vision. This is the dream of where we're going. Now, we're not there yet, but this is the journey that, that, that James and myself and Andrew and the team have been working on for many years. And it's why the wealthy coin becomes so important because it becomes the catalyst to really unlock this this vision and so that was all from from my side i just wanted to share before we got on a little bit if you guys have um a couple of minutes i would love to just run through some of the um some of the questions if you don't mind yeah that'd be great so just quickly and, and in no particular order you did answer it to some extent uh, andrew but what do you think uh, the Cape Town Day Zero is going to have an effect on the South African economy? <clears throat> and will it? Look, sorry, will I, it affect the world as well? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm mildly optimistic that we hopefully can avoid it. Um, you know, but if it happens, you know, we have to face up to it. I think you know we can't we can't put our head in a hole. If it happens, it's going to be it's going to be really bad. Um, you know, it's going to have a, a serious impact on tourism. Uh, the you know if if you think of a foreign a foreign tourist when he comes to South Africa for ten days, he'll probably spend five or six of those days in the Cape, and um, you know if he cancels his trip because of what's going on in Cape Town, he's he's probably going to cancel his entire trip, which is going to affect where he might have been going in KZN or in Gauteng or in Pumalanga or wherever. So, I think that that's going to be a problem. Um, you know, just a lot of small businesses in Cape Town already laying off people. Um, you know, the nursery, a lot of the nurseries and garden centres are already um, making people redundant. Um, so I, th I think it's going to be, I think it's going to be very negative for the economy. And I think it speaks to a bigger picture, um, certainly. And and I think if 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 the, the the local and and regional governments in the Cape don't get some dialogue going constructively with national government. Um, you know, I, I don't think it bodes particularly well. But as I said, I just hope, I really hope it doesn't happen. But having said that, you know, crisis um, creates innovation and, and it brings people together and people change behavior. So you know, I, don't, I don't think it's the end of the world, but it's certainly going to knock us back a bit. So, James, for your, from your side, um, a question here. What's the outlook on the yen? Seen Tencent come under pressure recently. I uh, must be honest, I haven't looked at the yen. Um, I'm a little bit confused by the question because 10 cents in China and the yen's in Japan, If I'm, unless I'm missing something completely. I yes. don't know if we mean yuan, uh, the yuan as in, in China, the yuan. Um, okay, so if you haven't looked at that, I'll move on. Um, next question is, what's the outlook for gold? Is the point to invest in gold as a protection? Um, long, long term on gold, um, we are still in a, a long term correction of that, the peak that we saw a, a few years back. Um, and I think we're probably, um, close to a top on gold the next uh, couple of months. And then I'm looking for the next, you know, balance of the year gold to be under pressure. So um, I think there'll be better buying opportunities for gold. I still see it as being a store of value long term. It's been like that for for centuries. But um, yeah, we'll probably have a better buying opportunity in the in in the months ahead. 
Okay, Andrew, this is a pretty uh, tough question, I suppose, but um, but equally, I think you've already answered it with, with your forays into Bitcoin. Uh, someone asked here, do you see cryptocurrency or blockchain as a threat to your business? Um, we certainly we certainly are concerned about it. Um, and I can't say exactly why, because, you know, we go through this, um, you know, this con this conversation around our board, board table all the time about the adoption of technology and better ways of paying. Um, I think what to a certain extent protects businesses like ours is, is uh, regulation. Um, and the banking sector, because the banking sector have a lot of influence with the regulators, um, and it's an industry worth protecting, I have to say. And um, so I think to an extent we sheltered in that respect, but not forever. Um, we we are always looking at ways of making our systems better. I mean, Scott, you know, just in South Africa, we're trying to get to the point where people can just click on 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 our system and do that one thousand dollar payment. Um, we're busy going through reserve bank approval. Um, once we get that, that approval, I think we'll be the first people in South Africa as a legitimate um, uh, currency brokerage that can do it. But, you know, short of swiping your credit card at the moment, it's probably cheaper just to use your credit card for a really small transaction, which is, it pains me saying that. You know, in the UK, it's not. You know, if you use us globally, we, we're very, very cost effective. So I think that, um, you know, I think that depending on what happens with regulation, which just seems to get, be getting more and more and more, um, I think the the effect of of blockchain and Bitcoin is probably going to be less effect on us in the in the short term, but uh, longer term, for sure, our, our our industry is going to see a lot of disruption, and quite what it looks like, I don't know, but we do we do we do keep an eye on it. There's two questions here um, from Mark and EJ. One is when's the right time to invest in cryptocurrency? And what are the top three to five? And also, which exchanges can we use to buy cryptos, um, et cetera, et cetera? Guys, my request is that we'll go through that in more detail tomorrow night. I do I do back up what James said, though. I, I believe there's three things that are really important in any uh, cryptocurrency. Firstly, you need to look at whether there's an existing business with an existing fundamentals and basically, in simple terms, a business that knows how to make money um, because all of us have been entrepreneurs and what most people don't realize is that writing a white paper is not a business making one dollar is harder than people think the second thing is a team that knows how to execute and has you know a track record of executing and the third thing and the most important thing is that the cryptocurrency is going to be based on ultimately supply and demand and so there needs to, you need to be solving a global problem like there needs to be enough demand for a problem that you're solving and then coming back to what everyone said tonight a limited supply but you know we will go through that in a lot more detail uh, tomorrow night ricardo has um given us an update um for you and me andrew it's 16.9 uh, million bitcoins have been mined to date and the difficulty wow. increases every five years so again it's it is then 2021 so it was last year that the difficulty i see i didn't know this and it explains so much of what happened in 2017 because effectively the difficulty halves every five years or double sorry uh, the difficulty doubles every five years um yeah. now here's a question and and we can all agree to disagree on this uh someone's asked should you be investing in the uk the usa or other i don't know if anyone wants to throw out a, a, a thought i know as an example andrew you help guys invest in portugal as well with um uh to get eu passports and stuff yo well, i'll answer that i think that really really depends um you know, there you're just talking about country risk um, or, or, you know, the fundamentals of the, those particular countries. I think we've all been a bit shaken about what's happened in, in, in the UK and, and the US in the last couple of years because it just shows that, you know, like, you know, all systems are not forever. So I think there's a lot of change coming in those in those markets. Um, but I think looking at the fundamentals, I like, um, I personally think that the UK is a great place. But again, you know, the UK, as small as it is, um, you know, there are lots of places in the UK that if you're talking about real estate, um, I, you know, I think London's overpriced at the moment. There's certainly a correction happening there. It's not a crash. But, um, you know, I think with, with the Brexit uncertainty, certainly slowed the market down there. But if you go further north, there's a lot of activity. Um, I think the Brits, by extracting themselves from Europe in the long term, will, will, will do really well. Uh, that's just my view, I think. Europe is very socialist and, and quite cumbersome. Um, I also I also believe in the US. I think they they're very 
innovative people. Um, they're very powerful economically. So it really depends on, 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 on and, and I guess it also depends on what the underlying asset class is. But, um, for, you know, from a, from a South African point of view, um, if the question is coming from South African, um, as a diversification strategy, I think either of those markets is interesting. James, from your perspective? Yeah, interesting. Um, yeah, US, US and UK, possibly yes. But again, as Andrew said, it depends what you're investing in, you know. Um, I think long term for South Africa, there are there definitely are risks, um, and you you want to get you know your investments into hard currencies, um, but uh, you know the dollar is the dollar again it is going to be on the back foot I think in the, in years to come. So you need you need to be careful of that I think. Um, because if you know it has been the reserve currency, and I think it's the one that's going to be the you know, the greatest risk um, if cryptos if crypto takes over in terms of of uh, you know re persons moving to that in cent instead of uh, a dollar as a reserve currency. Oh. so you know, guys, the way I always answer that is that. Uh, Firstly, you need to have the right information, and secondly, you need the right partners. You know, whether you invest in South Africa, England, Australia, America, or anywhere else on the planet, if you don't have the right partners on the ground, you're never going to succeed. Um, so it's really important that you get the right information, and the right partners. And the second thing that I think is really important is that now with technology, you know, when I first met Andrew and James, we we literally you you had to take a punt. You know, if you had a hundred thousand dollars, you had to take a punt. Was it England? Was it America? Was it Australia? Was it South Africa or anywhere else? And you could probably put down a deposit on a, on a house or apartment, and that was it. And what I love with where technology is going now is, you know, to answer Mark's question, I don't think you need to choose anymore, Mark. I think you can invest in England, uh, America, Australia, South Africa, and, and have a diversified portfolio with good quality partners, you know, good quality projects, um, but yet manage it all in one place from a technology perspective, which I know for a fact, having owned houses on four continents, you don't want to add uh, difficulties and hassles to your life. Um, but, but you know, the beauty of technology is that it allows us to to solve that problem. There's a question here, Jillian's asking, what sort of currencies beside Bitcoin would you recommend investing in? Again, Jillian, my request, um, you know, for the purposes of tonight is, um, is you know, I'd really recommend coming along and, and learning from uh, David Orban tomorrow night. I mean, Ether literally was the second coin after, after, um, after Bitcoin. And, I mean, he's literally one of the most respected people in the world in this space. Um, Ryan said, it seems to me that most of the value and potential for growth lies in blockchain technology as a whole and not in a specific cryptocurrency. Would investment in companies at the leading edge of blockchain technology not be more promising and less risky investment than in the Bitcoin bubble that looks doomed to burst and potentially valueless lesser cryptocurrencies, i.e. invest in producer rather than product? Um, Ryan, I think you've hit the nail right on the head. You know, my gut feel is that uh, blockchain is the game changer um, and it's the underlying technology behind the cryptocurrencies. So you need to find a blockchain application that's going to have a, a significant impact on the world. And um, and then no matter what happens in the economy, where there's a problem and there's a solution that is far better than the current solution, there will always be a demand. And as long as there's a limited supply, then obviously that's where the, where the value is going to be derived. So I, I completely agree with you. I, I think it's critically important that you look for blockchain uh, focused companies that are solving significant problems and have a track record of delivery. Uh, PJ says, does James see any chance of the RAND getting down in the region of eight uh, RAND to the dollar? Uh, I see a possibility of perhaps under nine um, at a push. But um, once we once we've got there, and you'll know when we are there, when everyone's saying it's a it, it's a, it's on a a winning streak that no one can stop. Um, yeah, from then on, it's we back to long term depreciation. So, um, so James, you have to make me a promise. Um, when it gets to eight eighty eight, uh, can we please do a live event again and put two hundred people in the room? 
and then you can show us your graphs and I can ask you the probability. And when you tell me it's a 90% probability of going above 10, hopefully this time more people will listen. <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll keep that promise. <clears throat> So guys, listen, um, you know, I think we've been through most of the questions. I, I really respect uh, both your time and for everyone who's been on tonight. Thank you for sharing as, as much as you have. I, um, I'm not sure if there's any final questions that, that need to come through um, in terms of tonight, but I think we've been through most of them. If there's any burning questions, send them through. I'd like to just sort of close out with, with final thoughts uh, from both of you around, you know, 20, 2017 was a very tumultuous year. A lot of people, you know, particularly when you take the South African situation, emerging markets, what's happening in first world economies, what's your thoughts? Are you positive about uh, where we're going in the future or are you concerned? Uh, let's start with, with you, James. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm, uh, I must admit I'm, I'm a bit concerned as to what's, where we're heading this year. Um, you know, if you just look at the, I mean, from the local perspective in South Africa, you've got a lot of, um, there's a lot of pent up stress there and you know, something like the water crisis in Cape Town if that does happen um, what, what, what effect will that have in sparking social unrest um, but then again you've got you know, I think everywhere globally there's, there's uneasiness um, and at the same time, there's you look at you know stock markets and that sort of thing. We're sitting at levels where we we probably due for a major correction. So um, yeah, I think 2018 is going to be an interesting year. Um, not uh, I'm I'm a, I'm a little bit nervous about 2018 to be honest. <laughs> to be honest. Oh, fantastic! And Andrew, from your side. Yeah, I think um, I, I personally think that we've uh, in in the South African context. I think we've we've been through pretty much the, the worst that we could. I don't think it. I, I think last year was just a very negative year. Um, I think that we're going to see po sort of positive signs. I'm 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 actually mildly positive. I'm not um, I'm not saying we don't have major structural issues. We do we do have that. But I do think that there's uh, you know just talking to the average man in the street, and it doesn't matter who they are. I think people are sick and tired of, 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 of what's going on and people want to see some, some real change. So I think that the, the politicians have got the mandate to, to do something different. And um, I'm quite hopeful. I think South Africa just kind of always bumbles along. Um, we, we've been in that, in that real sort of, um, you know, I mean, you know, the, the, the government recently has tried to control the media. They've tried to attack the, the you know, the justice system. I think a lot of that's going to go away now. Um, of course, I think we're going to hear from the EFF on the fringes making a noise. But I think the average South African doesn't really want to be burning things and breaking things. So that, that's my view. And I think globally, I don't think the, I, I think that the you know I think the world's in a reasonably good space. I, I think that technology and, and artificial intelligence and all these things are going to have a, a, a devastating, potentially devastating effect. But I think we're going to start seeing um, a, a pushback. And I think we're going to start seeing people going back to more local community ways of doing things. You see it the way people are eating now. You see it the way people are doing a lot of things, where people are actually trying to go back to a slightly simpler lifestyle. And I think we're going to start moving. The world's got to move to a place where technology and those sort of basic human needs are, you know, work together. And I think the people who can get that right are the guys who are going to make a lot of money. So guys, thank you to both of you. You know, from, from, from my perspective, it's always an honor and a privilege to learn and listen. You know, for those of you watching the recording, click on the link below and, and I'll give you the links. Um, also, um, James has a special offer for anyone if, if you want to. So um, I'll put it uh, in the chat box, uh, James, if you can give it to me or if you, if you want to share it on the screen uh, quickly. And also, if you're watching the recording, click on the link below. I'll put it, uh, you know, below the YouTube uh, video. And, um, and really what, what's really important is that you've got to get the right research. And, you know, there's plenty of research out there on the Internet. But I've watched James for 10 years, and I'm, I guarantee you Andrew will back me up here. It's uncanny how accurate he is. Even when the finance minister's fired, I think the RAND's going to plummet, like he said. 
and yet it goes the other way. Um, and, and again, that's where you know sentiment doesn't necessarily get involved. Uh, sorry, sentiment's involved, and it's, and it's based on formulas and, and really understanding. And equally, from Sable's perspective, you know, if you're wanting to understand how to move money, you're wanting to speak to the experts, you're wanting to speak to people that do it on a day-to-day -day basis, then deal with them. You know, if, if you go to your bank teller, they're going to promise the world and, and not deliver. And I've got uh, thousands of clients um, as testimonials to, to, to that point. You know, my thoughts on, on where the world's going is that uh, I, think you need to, I think you need to have a, a positive and negative view. I think we've spoken a lot about the markets. I think you need to have a cautious approach. I think there is going to be corrections. If you, if you buy assets high, there's a good chance that you're going to join the middle and lower class where, where when the market's correct, uh, those assets are going to be bought off you by the top 1%. And I really encourage you to get the information and the knowledge so that you can invest like the top 1%. However, saying that, um, coming down to what you said, Andrew, I'm, I'm very uh, optimistic in terms of where technology is going. And I, I truly believe that technology can solve uh, some of the greatest challenges on the planet. You know, I had a meeting yesterday with a guy that wants to solve the environmental problems. Um, you know, we, we want to solve the wealth gap, you know, the 17 global challenges. And, you know, if technology can solve all of them, then I think we'll have a far better, uh, you know, better and more sustainable planet for all. And, and that's really what we all need to focus on. So. Thank you for everyone's time tonight. I, I really, really appreciate it. Hopefully, you've had lot, lots of value. Give us feedback, good and bad. We're always wanting to improve. And uh, Andrew and James, I really appreciate it. And Alex there as well. Thank you very much for your time. I really appreciate it tonight. Thank you. Pleasure. Thank you for the opportunity, Scott. Yeah, thank you, Scott. I don't know how it's best to actually share that link for the free trial if someone wants to take yeah. that up. You mean quickly? I'm going to put it in the recording below, but for those who are still online now, um i'm going to make you the presenter quickly james if you can just okay. put the link up are we up there oh, give me two seconds so i'm just where's it going now i've got the questions in the way <laughs> uh yes oh, we got it perfectly yep so it's forexforecast.co.za okay. forward slash go forward slash free trial with a with a hashtag with a what do you call that thing a dash yeah, so I mean, just yeah, try it out for yourselves, and if you find value in it, we'd we'd love to help you going forward. Yep. So I'm going to I'm going to just I'm typing this in so people can click on it. So forecasts. Dot co. Dot za forward slash go forward slash free uh, trial. Um, yeah. Okay. So that's another thing. And then, um, uh, Andrew, just from your perspective, how do you, how do you suggest people get hold of you um, at Table if uh, if you're wanting to if they're wanting to understand from a currency perspective? Um, our website is sableinternational.com, and people can email me directly, Andrew at sableinternational.com, or Sable, you can connect. Sable International one word, huh? Yeah, Sable International one word dot com. Right. Otherwise, um, they can just they can they can message me on on LinkedIn. Perfect. Okay. Well, listen, guys, I've, I've I've put both those links in the chat box, and for those that are watching the recording, they'll be down below in the um, in you know the comment section below. So I think that's all for tonight. Thank you, everyone, for your time, and uh, see you at the next webinar. Cheers. Cheers. Thank you. Thanks.